Broadcasting to the Wizarding World since 2008. HP ANA's official Harry Potter podcast. Official Harry Potter podcast. This. 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 Is Hogwarts Radio. This is Hogwarts Radio, episode 211 for September 2nd, 2018. Hogwarts Radio's HPANA.com's podcast discussing all things Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, and the rest of the Wizarding World. For the quickest up-to-date news on the franchise, make sure you check out HPANA.com. Hello everyone, and this is Hogwarts Radio broadcasting to Harry Potter fans worldwide since 2008. I'm Terrence Pinkston. I'm Bailey Riddle. I'm Luke Hogan. And I'm Gretchen Rush. Our show can be found virtually anywhere online, such as iTunes, the Google Podcast app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, YouTube, and other places where podcasts are aggregated. It doesn't matter where or how you listen, just make sure to tap the subscribe button, and we guarantee you'll have a new episode each Sunday. HogwartsRadio.com is in the midst of a complete redesign. In the meantime, we invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram so you'll never miss an update from the show. Hogwarts Radio is also on Patreon. By pledging, you'll have instant access to many benefits, including exclusive merchandise, host blogs, behind-the-scenes planning of the show, Hogshead Radio, and much more. Visit Patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to sign up today. Welcome, listeners, to episode 211, and welcome to our patrons listening to us record live on Patreon.com today. Woohoo! Yeah, man, that was very well choreographed, everyone. Nice job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I love it. <laughs> well, how was everybody's journey back to Hogwarts? Everybody get settled in? It was going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Oh, that's always a good time. I, that lady with the snack cart, though. Ah, I don't know how, how trustworthy she is. Well, I, don't I don't know. We'll it, talk about it later. This, this, the, the compartment that I was in had uh, somebody threw like Peruvian darkness powder. So everybody went crazy. Pe- well, we're glad that everybody is settled back in, all set for a new term. And this got me thinking this week, why do some people get Deathly Hallows tattoos on their bodies? And I mean, this this is a... Okay, so the symbol is symbolic of Grindelwald, but like, not. I don't think everybody knows that, you know? I mean, like they know it, but they don't really look at the meaning behind that symbol. No, I 100% think it's because it was the last book and it was a cool symbol associated with the end of the series. So it's more of like a a book reader thing to me than like, ooh, the meaning behind it and the three pieces and the lore and Grindelwald. And I don't, I mean, I don't have one. So I'm speaking as someone who does not know, but that's what I always thought when I see people who get it. Speaking as also someone who doesn't have one, uh, I think it definitely comes from the book, but even in that seventh book, I don't think people in canon necessarily always think of Grindelwald. I mean, that's, I think only Durmstrang students seemed to know that. I mean, Hermione had no idea what it was, so it doesn't seem like it's that well known as something that he carried around all the time. I mean, I think maybe older parents and things like that would have learned that or been aware of it, but even in the story, like we find out that it was only Crumb that kind of took offense for that specific reason. So I, I don't think it's necessarily as linked to Grindelwald, even in the story, as as it might seem, that it's going to definitely seem in the upcoming films. Yeah. I mean, coming as the voice on the podcast of someone who does have the Deathly Hallows <laughs> tattoo, um, I think it's kind of, it, it shows that there are choices we have to make in life and that some of them are easy and obvious, like taking the resurrection stone or taking the elder wand that are going to be something that'll make you powerful or help you see something that you want to see. But it's choosing that tough choice of the invisibility cloak that's going to protect you and save you in a way that you might not think about. And I think that it just shows every day we make choices that help to further us in life. Was that the main reason you got yours, Bailey? Um, Partially that. And then just as it kind of represents Harry Potter as a whole for me. Um, went through a really hard time in high school. And so Harry Potter kind of helped me get out of like a bit of a depression. So Yeah, and it kind of symbolizes the culmination of the story too, right? So it, it's kind of the overarching thing that you can take. I feel like the lightning bolt is so like attributed to book one, like mm-hmm. early, early Harry, it's baby Harry stuff. This is the thing that kind of culminates the whole story. This is everything that we worked for. 
and work towards without realizing it. And it, I think it, it does kind of wrap everything up into a nice symbolic tri- trilogy of, of items, which is neat. Yeah, Harry faces a lot of hard things in his life and he's able to overcome them. So I feel like that was also a symbol that I really related with. Yep. All right, let's go get him. <laughs> <laughs> see, I, see, I would have thought that the scar would symbolize much more. You know, the lightning bolt would, would symbolize much something much more because it's something that Harry had to carry with him for the rest of his life. It was a result of something horrific that happened to him and his entire family and ended up representing a lot more uh, to the Wizarding World, too. I mean, it, we all remember book one where everybody's like, oh, my God, he has the scar on him and, and all that stuff. So I, I, you know, I personally, I mean, it's like if, if I was going to get a tattoo, which I, I mean, I might someday, um, I would get a lightning bolt somewhere that would symbolize that. But, you know, that that's what it that's what a tattoo is. Right. It's like it's a different it's a different meaning for it each individual you know you get something because it represents you well and that stuff yeah yeah i'm curious why people get the dark mark i want to talk to those people Ooh. we'll see i've also that because my last name is riddle so <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true bailey you had a funny story you were going through tsa a couple of days ago and uh it, oh they questioned you horrible <laughs> So I was wearing a Gryffindor shirt and the TSA agent, he kept looking back and forth between my ID and back to me, back to my ID and back to me. And he's like, you know what I'm looking at, right? And I'm like, um, it's an old picture. And so he said, no, your, your last name. And I kind of looked down at my shirt and I'm like, oh, I see what you're getting at. So I pointed out that, you know, just because my last name is Riddle doesn't necessarily mean I should be a Slytherin. Just like Sirius was a black doesn't mean he should be a Slytherin also. Well, as we get closer and closer... It's that time of the year again where we have a new movie coming out and uh, there's a lot of things happening. A lot of things are in motion right now and the news cycle, the Harry Potter news cycle is in full swing. And uh, Gretchen, we have a bit of news this week concerning the crimes of Grindelwald. Yeah, the news this week's a little funny for us because we're trying to avoid spoilers. So I guess it's a bit more of an announcement that if you are interested, a lot of media outlets were invited to visit the set and came out of that visit with a lot of information, some spoilers, some interviews with the cast and crew. um, And it's really cool. But some of the media outlets that went were MuggleNet, Cosmopolitan, Fandango, ComingSoon.net, Movie Phone, The Leaky Cauldron, and Collider. Did you guys check it out or no? Nope. Keep the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to look at them. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's wonderful that the information's there for people that want it, but I'm not one of those people. And it's hard to say because, you know, we we do a Harry Potter podcast and we talk about Fantastic Beasts and we theorize and stuff. But, I, you know, I think it's more special uh, for the movie going experience is if we don't know a lot of the information going into the movie. You know, I, I want to be left in the dark about certain things. And the plot line is one of those things. And I think that we get a lot more information about that in some of these articles. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in pretty heavily in a couple different fandoms that are in similar spots right now. Fantastic Beasts and with Game of Thrones new season coming out and with all the leaks from before season seven there. I'm not someone who's afraid of spoilers or like completely ignores them or, you know, goes after them. If I learn something, that's not a big deal, except for like the few fandoms that I am fully fully invested in like that's something that i want it to be told i want the story to be told the way it's gonna the, the final copy i want the, the the story to be told the right way and if it's something that i'm like ah, i'm interested you know like that's cool like that's neat but not like they, they have a couple of sacred fandoms and and those are those are two of them and um the fantastic beast when i really like this opportunity that we're going to get as movie goers like gretchen definitely stated uh we haven't had an opportunity to see it you know other than the first one of these this whole series it's the first time we get a chance to experience it for the very first time in the theater yeah i mean i'm not like outright trying to avoid any spoilers but i'm also not going to go out of my way to go to these websites and take out or take a look at their set visit information just because i want to keep myself as spoiler free as possible and i like being wrong a lot yeah so let's play (laughs) wild wild guess i love it so we were talking about september 1st and going back to hogwarts and the wizarding world of Harry Potter in Orlando had a little meetup on September 1st for the fans. Um, And then throughout the month, they're also doing back to Hogwarts photo scavenger hunts in Hogsmeade and Diagon Alley. And they're doing it a couple of different days. So if you are near there or can get near there in September, that would be a pretty cool thing to go to. 
I love that they're getting involved. And yeah, I feel like this is an opportunity that they could have taken advantage of since the park opened. They this is really a missed opportunity, so I'm glad that they finally decided they're going to do something. Well, and I wonder if it's just because it's the also the 20th anniversary of Sorcerer's Stone. It's September 1st, so they were like, ooh, we'll capitalize on that. Finally do something. Ooh. It's such an easy thing, too, that they're doing. So because it's the 20th anniversary of Sorcerer's Stone, like I said, in the United States, as of September 1st, Pottermore is offering unlimited access to the ebook at public libraries in North America. So it's from August 27th to September 10th. So that's not as of September 1st. I, I apologize. <laughs> this article. Um, so <laughs> That's okay. They know so what you mean. So from August 27th to September 10th, you can have access to the ebook, which is cool. And is kind of a way to bring it to people who like ebooks and don't want to purchase them and might want to just check it out on their e-reader rather than reading the physical copy. It's kind of nice. That's cool. I, I like that they have this option available. Uh, but for me, there's nothing like picking up a hard copy of an actual book and flipping through the pages. <laughs> I, I, you know, yeah, this, I wish- this is a cool idea. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to bash it or anything like that. And I think it's wonderful that it's available at public libraries. At the same time, I'm just like, uh, I prefer a real book as compared to any, but I'm not a real big ebook person. It's not my favorite thing. I wish this applied to the audiobook as well, because I know you can borrow that through the public libraries. Um, so that's something that I know, at least for my library, you have to wait. Oh, God, 120 people at any given time are waiting for that ebook. Wow. For maybe 10 copies. So it, it takes a while to actually get through all of the Harry Potter audiobooks through the library. Yeah. I mean, with all the podcasting things, I I find the ebook for things like that, like taking notes is incredibly valuable taking notes in chapters with different colored highlighters with notes built into it like i've i've come to really enjoy it as a tool if i was experiencing a book for the first time i think i'd be more comfortable with doing that since i've gotten so used to it at this point i'm an audiobook hound i mean i i just i crush through them all the time and uh it's so like that's my that's my go-to but for really digging into something, it's nice. Like for the Harry Potter series, I have books one through seven complete series in one Kindle file. So it's great to be like, oh, is this really the first time this character or this magic vocabulary was mentioned? Do a quick search. It takes two seconds. It's like, yep, this is the first one. Or uh, you actually didn't talk about that two chapters ago. Nice job. But uh, I, I find it to be a very valuable tool. And uh, I'm, I'm becoming more of a fan with the more I use it. Yeah, I just like the ease of transportation. It's a lot easier to read on my little Kindle than it is to lug all my books around. So I like that. So if you've never read an ebook and feel like checking it out, you have that chance if you're in North America to get it from your public library. So that's pretty cool. A uh, couple fun articles from MuggleNet that I want to shout out. Uh, one of them I wrote. So I got to write a really cool article of looking back at the news when Sorcerer's Stone was first published. And it was really interesting to see the reviews that were written and um, how it kind of changed the landscape of children's publishing and the bestseller list. And I listened to a news report about it where the woman said like, oh, I think muggles might really come into the the vocabulary of like the world. And I'm like, yeah, it might. So it was a really fun article to research. So if you feel like checking that out, it's called Mr. Stone, What Was the News 20 Years Ago? And if you're a Patreon or a patron on Patreon, I'll have that link in the doc once it goes live. And then another cool one from MuggleNet is called Harry Potter from Book Series to Global Brand. And she kind of looked at how did they develop a marketing strategy when they first started, Warner Brothers, and then like how did it develop? And what did they do and what didn't they do? And where are they now? So that was also a really fun one to read. That was a really cool article. Um, both, of yeah. these, both of these were incredibly wonderful. Uh, just about right. the... Uh, the news 20 years ago and and even how it was reported you know the media landscape has changed it's evolved i mean just in the past hell even the past 10 years and how harry potter news is consumed and and reported uh pretty much anybody with a smartphone and you know time on their hands can can report on the news as opposed to like 10 years ago it was just you know whoever had a uh, Sony camera and they were taking it to movie premieres and stuff like that and throwing it up on YouTube. But um, yeah, both these articles, really, really wonderful, well-written. Uh, they were enjoyable reads and uh, hats off to both of you ladies. I think Lucy wrote the one for the uh, global brand one 
And that one was really interesting as well. And is that all the news this week? That is it. Okie doke. Let's go ahead and move on to our one announcement. (laughs) We're just two patrons away from (laughs) our first official goal. Remember that there are different tiers that you can choose from that bring different benefits on each tier. We invite you to visit patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to get started and explore the different tiers that we have. Watch the video that we made. It was it's a wonderful video that really explains what we're doing with our patreon and you know you can listen live just like some of our patreons are doing right now they're beautiful in the live chat we love them (laughs) that we do okay before we jump into our part three of our series black discussion let's go ahead and read some social media reactions from last week episode and for those of you that may not remember last week's episode uh, first of all go listen to it again it was wonderful Uh, one of my favorite episodes that we've ever done secondly we discussed the relationships of Sirius black and uh, we I, I think we stuck a lot of time on Harry's relationship with him. And so I asked the question on Twitter, is Harry's relationship with him toxic? We've had a lot of responses regarding that. So I'm going to read just a couple today. The first one comes from Charlotte. She says, I wouldn't say it was toxic, just that Sirius fed the kind of rebellious hero side of Harry because he saw his best friend in him and wanted him back. But Harry knew love from Sirius, and I think it was better for knowing him. Maria Rosa Baroni writes, I partly agree. He lived vicariously through Harry. He saw his dead best friend in Harry and had the maturity of 20 year ish old instead of a instead of a grown man. All of this due to his time in Azkaban. He was dealt some bad cards. Millie responds, totally disagree. He protected and supported Harry, just like a father, even if he saw James in him, and he was proud about that. He was the best godfather anyone could ever dream of. It's even more obvious in the books. And finally, Fencing Librarian says, Toxic in the sense that Sirius really didn't know how to parent Harry and never got a chance to try. Harry would have accepted Sirius as a substitute parent despite his shortcomings. So there's a lot of varying of people saying, well, maybe he had a toxic relationship, but it wasn't toxic. You know, there was there was a lot of different opinions. Yeah, I mean, we I think we had a hard time kind of really coming. We, we talked a lot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think that's because there's so many different angles you can look at it. It just depends on kind of what your assumptions are going into it and what your values for Harry are at certain times in his life and it, there are no right answers parenting's hard that's the end of it i mean it's it's a hard thing to do so just keep trying yeah there's not a comment i disagree with so i think it's a complicated subject and you can kind of see it from every angle well and i think that's why our discussion on Sirius has been so lengthy because there's so much you can relate to but also disagree with at the same time agree to disagree I suppose. Thank you to those who responded to us out on Twitter. We appreciate your interaction. Okay, so we're going to move into part three of our discussion. And uh, we're going to try to... There's a lot to unpack still with Sirius, but we're going to move through it as methodically as we can. All right, so let's let's start touching on the first Wizarding War, War, 1981. After leaving school, Sirius fought against Lord Voldemort, eventually joining the Order of the Phoenix... Around 1977, he and James were involved in a motorbike chase with two policemen. Although the chase started off as a bit of fun, it turned slightly more serious when the pair were attacked by three men on broomsticks. Sirius and James used their wands to raise the police car that had been chasing them, and their attackers crashed into it. It is unknown whether they got into trouble with the Ministry of Magic. Hey, and and real quick, thank you to Stephen from Ontario who pointed this out to us on Twitter. I completely forgot about this prequel that J.K. Rowling wrote. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a bit of fun with Sirius and James and the Muggle policemen. But I, you know, I wonder if they had to have gotten in trouble with, with, uh, with the Ministry of Magic. You know, magic in front of Muggles much less on muggles. <laughs> yeah, I remember when this this article came out. I I feel like this was one of the first actually JK written things that had come out after book 7. Like in canon Pottermore. Like this was like one of the first things on Pottermore too. Is that correct? Like we started Pottermore and it was like the book recap thing, but then this was like the first published article by her on there. Am I wrong on that? Sounds like it might be familiar. But it was just I was 
when that came out, I was so excited. Like it was just such a cool thing. You're like, hey, she has the ability to to do these things. And whether right or wrong, if it's canon or not, I, I feel like something like this is. And it's it's just cool. It's fun, like Terrence said, and uh, I like the characterization of they're just again, they're still kids, just out of school. I mean, living wild and crazy wartime life. I I think it's fun. It's cool. I just learned this, so this was fun to learn. Thanks, Luke, and thanks, Stephen, from Ontario. Sometime in 1979, Sirius's father and brother both died. Orion's death was from an unknown cause, while Regulus's death was when he drank the drink of despair. And when he tried to get water to quench his thirst, he was dragged to death by the Inferi. Although Sirius never learned the details of his death. Poor Regulus. After joining the Order of the Phoenix, Sirius found himself rolling, roiling with mistrust and stress due to the great terror that was Lord Voldemort. It took its toll. By October 1981, he no longer trusted his old friend Remus Lupin, suspecting he was a spy and excluding him from important information. However, he trusted Peter Pettigrew implicitly, a decision he would grow to regret for the rest of his life. In 1981, the Potters were aware that Harry, along with the son of fellow Order members Alice and Frank Longbottom, had become Lord Voldemort's specific targets. Albus Dumbledore advised the Potters to go into hiding use the Fidelius, using the Fidelius charm, which Dumbledore hoped would conceal them from doom. James was adamant about Sirius being their secret keeper, believing that Sirius would willingly die rather than reveal where they were. However, believing Voldemort would suspect him, Sirius suggested Peter Pettigrew as a less obvious choice, keeping everyone else, including Remus Lupin and Albus Dumbledore, in the dark. Sirius and the Potters reassigned the Pettigrew to be secret keeper with Sirius as a decoy. I just couldn't imagine living with that kind of guilt uh, and, and what it would do to me, much less being locked in, in imprisonment, which we'll get to here in, here in just a minute. But like what that does to you psychologically, you know, he... S- Sirius really suffered because of this decision that he made. It's just so sad because he he says I would have died rather than betray them, but he doesn't get that chance. So sitting there thinking about how the fact that if you had been the secret keeper, they might still be alive because you would have died for them, but you couldn't. So now you're rotting in jail and they're dead anyway. And this jerk got them killed. Base. Yeah, that's dark. I, mean, I think it was a great chance to fool Voldemort had Pettigrew not been on the dark side. I think right. It, it was not a bad plan, except that it was a terrible plan. <laughs> so something that Gretchen just said kind of kicked me back to a thought we had on part one of Sirius, something that we kind of struggle with, I think, all four of us. And it, it comes from the, the fact that Sirius says he would die rather than betray his friends. And I think that is something we didn't really mention on being a main reason why when he's going after Peter Pettigrew, he's fine with killing him. He's that's a, li- a life He's already sacrificed. Life for life. He, he's already sacrificed his own mentally, mm-hmm. you know, it, trying to save the Potters. So for him, it's just a bonus being able to wipe Pettigrew out at that point because he's already to him that'd be like fulfilling his promise to sacrifice himself to save the Potters kind of thing. Even at two lives being lost isn't a benefit, but I can see how in his warped, prison-ridden brain that that he can get focused on that. I think we just didn't really touch on that much, and um, I think it's a valid thought at least. Yeah, so, and he was prepared to die for them. Then he's wasted twelve years of his life in prison that he wishes he could have still died for them. And I think at this point he doesn't care whether or not he goes to prison again or if he is murdered for murdering. Yeah. Let's imagine for a moment if Sirius had not chosen Peter Pettigrew as the secret if if Sirius would have stayed as the secret keeper, right? And let's say the Potters survived, but Voldemort would have probably reigned for more of a lengthier time than what he did. I mean, that probably a lot more deaths would have come out of just the 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 war that they were in because it all ended whenever the Potters died and uh, Voldemort tried to kill Harry. And that wouldn't have happened if Sirius was still the secret keeper. All right, let's talk about between the wars. So 1981 and 1995, his imprisonment on Halloween night in 1981, Sirius went to Pettigrew's hiding place and found him missing. Unsettled by the lack of signs of a struggle, Sirius frantically sped to Godric's Hollow, discovering the Potter's house destroyed and his friends dead. 
Only baby Harry was still alive. When Rubius Hagrid appeared on the scene to take Harry from him on Dumbledore's orders, Sirius offered to take Harry himself, as he was the chosen guardian in the event of James and Lily's death. However, Hagrid told him that Dumbledore had made arrangements to send Harry to Lily's sister, Petunia. Sirius conceded after an argument and gave Hagrid his flying motorcycle, telling him he wouldn't need it. Nevertheless, after Hagrid had handed over the baby, he intended to return Black his bike, but never got the chance. Sirius had given Hagrid the enchanted flying motorcycle 16 years prior at Godric's Hollow after Sirius discovered the Potters had been killed. After begging Hagrid to give him baby Harry, a request Hagrid refused because he had orders to take young Harry to Little Winging, Black gave Hagrid the bike before settling, setting off to hunt down Peter Pettigrew. The bike was in Hagrid's possession until it was needed to bring Harry from Number 4 Privet Drive to Order Headquarters shortly before Harry... 17th birthday. The bike ended up crashed as the order was ambushed by Death Eaters. Ted Tonks collected the debris and sent it to Arthur Weasley, who later repaired the bike and gave it to Harry. Okay, so so a lot to lot to unpack in this particular small statement. Firstly, hey, let's start with the beginning. Sirius told Hagrid he wouldn't need his motorcycle. Was Sirius on a suicide mission at that point to go hunt Pettigrew? Like, did he expect to not survive? I think so. I agree. Wow. Yes. Wow. That's... I, I, I don't know what to... I, I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Yeah, I think he was thinking about, like, okay, you need this to get Harry out of here. Like, first, let's make sure that Harry's okay, because Dumbledore is a plan. Great, I trust him. And then... I'm going to go do what I got to do and take care of this. So I don't need the bike. I think it, I think it was nice that uh, in the end, in the very end, Harry does end up getting the bike back. You know, that's kind of like, yeah, you're kind of like, you know, it's it's like you get a vehicle from a relative that's passed on, you know, if that, if that's ever happened to anybody. And it's just kind of really a nice sentiment that Harry has something to hang on to from Sirius other than Grimald Place. You know, it's a Sirius's bike. It's the bike that him and his, uh, that Sirius and, and Harry's dad caused, wreaked havoc on, you know, it was, you know, it's a flying motorcycle. That's so cool. I have a, I'm like, I, I want to throw these questions out there. I don't really want to unpack them right now because I feel like it would take a lot longer than it we, we should probably talk on but like what use is the motorcycle in in this case like and i know we've kind of gotten to this but like at this scene where sirius is like i'm not gonna need the bike hagrid you take the bike why isn't somebody just apparating to the potter's house and just just getting out of dodge like why is why, why is the motorbike being utilized here I, I can see why black's not gonna need it it's wow stuff has just hit the fan you know like this this war is just kind of blown wide open at this point. Who knows what's going on? It, there's a lot of havoc going on. And I think Sirius in his first moment is, yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. I'm going to be apparating everywhere. I'm not going to have time for joyriding. I'm not going to have time for playing around right now. I'm I'm just going to apparate and be done with it. So I'm, I'm not going to need it. Plus the, the likely suicide mission of, well, I'm going to go kill Pettigrew and I don't really care what happens to me at that point because he is the worst. And so I, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting to think like why the motorbike and Hagrid are being sent on this Harry picking up task. Well, how did Hagrid know. even get there in the first place? Right. So maybe he took like a slow method to get there. And then Sirius was like, oh, you should take my bike. It'll be a lot faster. Faster than apparating? Hagrid can't apparate. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. There's just a lot of, a lot of odd oddities to that whole situation that all kind of get back to the, the, the missing 24 hours question, which I know we've slightly touched on. But we'll never get an answer there to. Are no questions out there. <laughs> so many questions. All right. Well, we'll continue and see if <laughs> we have more questions. After leaving Godric's Hollow, Sirius, overcome with grief and rage, tracked Pettigrew down, determined to kill him in vengeance. However, Pettigrew outwitted Black. Confronted Sirius on a city street, he shouted out that it was Sirius who betrayed the Potter and then created a huge of the powerful blasting curse, killing 12 muggles in the process and enabling him to fake his own death and escaping in his animagus form leaving a severed finger behind his evidence. The surviving muggles who witnessed the event were pretty certain they saw Sirius murder their 12 companions and Pettigrew with the curse. And Fudge claimed to have seen Sirius laughing maniacally at the scene of the crime, suggesting that he thought Peter accidentally killed himself and found joy from that. So there's a co- couple of questions that I had about this. First of all, Peter Peter Pettigrew outwitted B- Sirius Black. How did this happen? Isn't Sirius supposed to be like one of the brightest wizards of his age? Sirius is like mad with rage, though. He's not serious. 
seeing clearly. Seeing red. <laughs> yeah, I always pictured this like, you know, a scene in a movie where someone's about to reveal something, but somebody else f first is like, she did it, she killed them. And then the person who's going to admit it is like, uh, no, that's definitely what they did. And so because someone else said it first, they don't have the chance to say it because now it sounds like they're lying because somebody else already said it. So I'm picturing Pettigrew just walking up to Black and being like, this guy killed him! Another question that I had was, uh, so Pettigrew created a huge explosion with the blasting curse. Why didn't the ministry just look at the last curse fired by Pettigrew's wand to determine Sirius's innocence? Because they did return his wand and the little bit of finger back to his mother, correct? Are those the two things they got back from her? No, the Order of Merlin and his oh, finger. That, that's what it was. So maybe the wand was destroyed in the blast. Yeah, what did happen to his wand? And what happens to your wand when you transform? Like, is McGonagall's wand just sitting on her desk while she's off being a cat? Does she have, like, a special <laughs> wand safe that she puts it in? We're open Does it shrink to cats? I could, a I whole could. lot of good <laughs> transfiguration. I could, here. I could just imagine McGonagall like being transfigured into a cat and then having a holster for her wand like Puss in Boots does. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> My cannon now. There you go. Yeah. Well, it's just an extension of them, so I think it transforms. Maybe That's you do very interesting. That's what those do. Those are <laughs> they're, they're just wands. <laughs> Oh, man. Sirius was arrested by the Department of Magical Law Enforcement and sentenced by Barty Crouch Sr. to life imprisonment in Azkaban without a trial for mass murder with the blasting curse. Mm. Giving the information about the Potter's whereabouts, which led to their death, and service Lord Voldemort. The surviving muggles were obliviated and given an excuse by the Muggle-worthy Excuse Committee that a gas leak occurred. Pettigrew was unjustly awarded the Order of Merlin First Class for his confrontation with Sirius, which, along with the finger that they recovered, was posthumously given to his mother. As the time passed, many believed that Black drew his wand and killed Pettigrew before the other had a chance of even drawing. Even the other remaining marauder, Remus, believed it was Sirius who betrayed their brotherhood. And that adds, of course, to the tension that already was already in place from Sirius thinking that Remus was actually a spy. Um... Was uh, guys, was this common practice from the ministry to send people to Azkaban without a trial? I mean, hell, even the Death Eaters got a trial, but they saw Sirius, and Sirius was like, "Meh, you know, this guy, this guy did 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 a lot of bad stuff. We're just gonna throw him in solitary confinement." I mean, isn't that a big part of Forty Crouch Senior's character that we learn through Book Four that like it was bad, like it was so bad that they were they were just basically rewriting the laws to deal with this because such massive proportions of dark wizards dark dark wizarding actions were taking place that it was like well we can't figure this out and there's more things happening we just don't have the manpower is is kind of what it feels like it comes down Sounds blacklist everything, and you start losing. It's I mean it's it's uh what now I, I can't remember the the oh the red scare no I, I, I basically you just you cut off freedoms and liberties because I had what. There's such manic atmosphere in the air that how do you deal with that? And sometimes it goes a little way overboard, which is, I think is where the ministry was. Sirius was placed in solitary confinement at the mercy of the Azkaban guards, the Dementors. Driven to the brink of madness, he retained his sanity by focusing on his innocence. It could not be detected by the Dementors because it was not a feeling, but it still allowed him to maintain a sense of self and regain enough strength to transform into his animagus form in his cell. Since Dementors have difficulty sensing the less complex emotions of animals, he was able to remain relatively unaffected as a dog. It was not at all trouble to them, though, since they thought it meant he was losing his mind like every other convict in their custody, including Bellatrix Lestrange and some of her fellow Death Eaters. So was he an Animagus for 12 entire years, or was it just like every once in a while he just kind of jumped into dog form? Just long enough to lose all of that darkness within him? Yeah, I always had the idea, I don't know why I had this idea, but I always thought that he was going back and forth. I, I wonder what the record is for longest time in your animagus form. That's Pettigrew. <laughs> yeah, like 13, 13 years for Pettigrew. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it is possible, yeah. But then again, we don't know if Pettigrew took like a, you know, a break from that and just popped up. Where's instead. Scabbers? I don't know. What's this funny Come man for doing? for coffee. <laughs> Sunbathing. <laughs> Sirius is brooding over his friend's deaths and Peter... 
Pettigrew's betrayal became an obsession as well. This was due to hearing many different theories regarding why Harry survived Voldemort's attack being made by the confined Death Eaters, the most persistent of which indicated that they believed Pettigrew to have betrayed them since the Dark Lord met his downfall on Peter's information. This most likely meant that Pettigrew went into hiding as a rat in hopes of avoiding the half of Voldemort's followers who avoided imprisonment afraid that they would be motivated to kill him if his continuing existence became known. Sirius waited until any sources reached within the prison walls, leading to the discovery that Pettigrew was staying with a wizarding family as a rat to keep up on current news about Voldemort, all while getting very weak with no hope of driving the Dementors back without his wand, which was getting taken, which was taken from him and stored away under Ministry of Magic safety repercussions. By 1985, Sirius's mother died, leaving the black house elf creature alone in the house, which was thus left abandoned. So let's talk about the second wizarding war. 1995 through 1998. With Lord Voldemort restored to his physical form, Dumbledore reinstated the Order of the Phoenix, sending Sirius to gather the old crowd and inform them of the situation. Sirius donated his family home of number 12 Grimmauld Place in London as Order Headquarters. Unfortunately, he was still wanted by the authorities. Sirius could never safely leave the house and became quite bitter over his perceived uselessness. When he briefly left the house to see Harry to the Hogwarts Express, Draco Malfoy nastily commented on uh, Harry on his pet dog, which coupled with Malfoy's comments made on the train suggested that the Malfoys recognize Sirius in his animagus form. Harry and Sirius stayed in touch during Harry's school year via Owls and the Flu Network, though Sirius' presence was nearly discovered by Dolores Umbridge during her dictatorial managing of Hogwarts that year. I kind of feel for Sirius on this because he's spent 12 years in Azkaban. He gets out and then he's forced to stay. He's like under house arrest, really, because he can't go anywhere uh, out of fear of being caught. So he'll just be in the room making no noise and pretending uh, he doesn't exist. <laughs> I can understand where he becomes bitter yeah. about this. And oh, yeah, he, you know, it, it, he wants to do something that's serious. Serious isn't just the kind to stand by and just let things happen. Serious wants to go out and make things happen. That's why he's feeling really useless. How much fun do you think he had when he was actually on the run? You know, like, especially like after. He meets after book three, like throughout book four, basically, when when he's just like hanging out in the caves. Like it was definitely rough living. But I mean, how free do you think he felt? Like that's about the epitome of free. I mean, no bills. You know, you don't have <laughs> no, no taxes. You just live in a cave no up on the hill. For, yeah. <laughs> you didn't have to pay that house elf tax. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Right. Um, that comes from the estate. <laughs> you know, I, I still feel like to serious that really just was awful, an awful way to live because, well, he he as bright as serious is, he would recognize that he really isn't free because he has to hide. You know, that's, that's the thing. And that's why he does all these rash things. I think like trying to talk to Harry in the fireplace or, you know, even sending messages to Harry via owl and, and stuff like that. I just, I I mean, I felt that was dangerous in itself. Yeah. Miss Weasley points out that he's doing like reckless stuff and, I mean, she's not wrong, but also when you spend 12 years in jail and then get out and people are like, just stay there, just stay in your room and and we'll solve this war. You're like, nah, man, my friends died for this. <laughs> well, And it's like prisoners come out the same age that they went in. You don't mentally develop when you're in prison. So I think that a lot of that has to do with Sirius's behavior once he gets out as well. Mm-hmm. So Sirius acted as more of a brother than a father figure to Harry throughout his hardships with Umbridge, encouraging him to oppose her reforms and strongly approving of Harry's secret defensive tutorial group for students, D- Dumbledore's Army. His vigorous support of Dumbledore's Army worried Hermione, who thought that Sirius was attempting to live vicariously through them. He also willingly answered all of Harry's questions about the Order and Voldemort though most of Harry's mentors felt that Harry was too young to handle the burden of the truth. He also urged Harry to contact him if Professor Snape gave him a hard time during their occlumency lessons. You know, it's kind of like that bigger brother that you have as it's always looking out for you. You No, don't don't screw with my don't screw with my little brother. Don't screw with Harry. You do. There's going to be problems. I don't know. I I mean, I look, I, I get it. He wants to help out. He wants to be useful. And this part, I really agree with Sirius on telling Harry Everything because what Harry's been said, Harry's been told by Dumbledore, somebody that he's grown to trust over the past five years at that point. Like, I'm gonna tell you everything. Oh, I'm gonna tell you everything. 
He doesn't tell him anything. And that's frustrating. I'm so glad that Sirius is there to really say, no, nah, this is what went down. And, you know, you have questions? Well, I've got the answers. During his time confined to the Order's headquarters, Sirius began to let himself go. Uh, Sirius began to let himself go. When Harry and the Weasleys arrived at Grimmauld Place just after Arthur was attacked by Nagini, Sirius was unshaven and still in his day clothes late at night. He also seemed to have taken up drinking as he had a Mundungus-like whiff of stale drink about him. However, Sirius made a complete turnaround when the Weasley family and Harry decided to stay at Grimmauld Place over the Christmas holidays for its proximity to St. Mungo's, and at one point was heard singing, God rest ye merry hippogriffs, at the top of his lungs. God rest ye merry hippogriffs. I feel like the recruiting world have to be the best. Yes. This is an interesting part in Sirius's life because there's this brief mention of him taking up drinking and then it's gone. So I'd actually, I mean, we see the story from Harry's point of view, but it's very interesting to think about from Sirius's point of view. Because at this point, he's just kind of locked in his childhood home where he was hated and he did the war effort and he decides to drink. And that's like a very serious thing that Harry's not going to deal with. So it's kind of interesting that it's mentioned at all. It's just a, a interesting thing to think about, I think, in Sirius's development as a character. It's a very dark place to be, right? Because this is a place that Sirius loathes, he hates, and he's alone there, right? And he slides into this depression and... It, I mean, look, I can't blame him for taking up drinking, really, because it's the only way that he thought of dealing with it. You know, it's the only way he could deal with it. What, he had Creature and then the screaming portrait of Mrs. Black? Like, uh, he, uh, you know, we're lucky that Sirius is still around that he didn't decide to off himself. Okay, so let's talk about the d battle of the Department of Mysteries and ultimately his death. So Voldemort used legitimacy to plant... A false vision into Harry's mind that Sirius was being tortured in the Department of Mysteries, convincing Harry that Sirius had, in fact, been captured. After giving Severus Snape a cryptic message, informing him of the situation, and then ditching Umbridge in the Forbidden Forest, Harry, along with Ron, Hermione, and fellow DA members Jenny, Neville, Luna, uh, flew to London via Thestral. The students made their way through the deserted Ministry of Magic, and gained access to the Department of Mysteries, only to be ambushed by Death Eaters. I wonder how long it takes to fly from Hogwarts to London by Thestral. <laughs> takes that one song. Isn't it like... You know, how's that song go? It's very happy, and they're like... That's actually like a really happy part of War of the Phoenix. They're like having a blast. It's just to really make you feel good. It's the only happy part. And then it all goes downhill, and you're like, oh, yeah. It was Snape who ultimately saved their lives by alerting the Order to what Harry had seen. Sirius, Kingsley, Tonks, Remus, Alistair Moody, and eventually Albus Dumbledore arrived at the Ministry and began battling the Death Eaters. Tragically, however, during a frenzied duel with his hated cousin Bellatrix, Sirius was struck with an unknown spell in the movies, it's Avada Kedavra, causing him to fall through the veil in the Death Chamber of course, to his death. It would be years before Harry could fully come to terms with the loss of his godfather, who, as Dumbledore flatly stated, was the closest thing to a parent Harry had ever known. Harry blamed himself for Sirius's death. It's interesting that you bring up that in the movie it's Avada Kedavra, because I remember that being a big theory when you read the fifth book. Because he goes through this veil, but you don't know what spell he was hit with, so you're not exactly sure if he's dead or not. So I guess in the movie they were like, and eh, we don't really want people to speculate about this, so we'll just make it very clear that he's dead. Yeah. The veil thing, I wish he would give us more information about. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. The uh, I was bothered by the way the movie did it because I, we're, we're so deep in book lore. You know, like, it's just, like, I, I like the the ambiguous, you know, ambiguous nature of it. It's like, well, he just fell through like and, and harry's struggle with that it's it's too big for the movie to get into and i agree that they probably did do the right thing but when i first saw it i was like 
no, 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 you can't just make that. You can't just say that that's what it was. Like, that's just, I was bothered by it. I had a lot of problems with a lot of the movies, <laughs> to oh, be yeah. fair. Um, but I don't know. Like, for, can I just throw out a, a really cool fan theory out there? Check out Super Carlin Bros video on the Hallows and their predecessors. There, I, I don't know the exact uh, YouTube video title, but there is a really, really cool thing that, the Veil was potentially a precursor built by the Peveril brothers um, way, way back uh, trying to create the Hallows. It's interesting stuff. That is very interesting because we don't know a lot about the Veil. So I, I would love to to kind of learn that backstory. Luke, if you find that, you know, let us yeah, know. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it and uh, I'll, uh, I'll get the link. Um, to answer at least uh, guess at the question that you asked earlier on how long would it take to fly from Hogwarts to, to London on a hippogriff. Uh, thestral. Doing, on a Thestral. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say that the flying speed is probably very similar between those two. Winged, large, horse-like beasts. Um, so I, I, I checked out Google Flights for Inverness, which is in Scotland, very, <laughs> very northern Scotland, um, to London. And it takes about an hour and 45 minutes by by easy jet it's a long trip i think sirius would have been seriously injured by then yeah it's true yeah huh sirius black's death scene from the movies let's take a listen <laughs> and we just heard bellatrix give avada kedavra sirius kind of has that one last look at harry smirks and just falls backward through the veil so this scene in the movie, fun fun fact, Remus Lupin comes to grab Harry from behind. And Dan, whenever they're filming this, lets out this kind of despairing scream. And you can hear right now this uh, the music over it. Well, they had to dub the music over that scream because everybody was so uncomfortable with that scream that Dan had let out, that just anguish. Just from the emotion you see on Dan's face in that scene, you can tell that that was very powerful for him, whether he was acting or not. Yeah, I like it without the sound, actually. I think it's a very powerful visual with the music. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about post-mortem. And in the aftermath of Sirius' death, Harry, enraged and grief-stricken, unsuccessfully attempted to take revenge on Bellatrix before Voldemort arrived even attempting to use the Cruciatus Curse, which we just heard from the movie. After a short duel between Dumbledore and Voldemort, the, they fled, but not before he was seen, not before Voldemort was seen by Cornelius Fudge himself and several other Ministry officials, forcing them to abandon their smear campaign against Dumbledore and Harry and admit the truth to the world. With that done, Dumbledore successfully convinced the Ministry that Sirius was innocent all along and managed to to get him cleared of all charges posthumously. Such a shame. Only in death was Sirius proven innocent. Only in death did things get better for Sirius in the real world. Yeah, it's, it's one of those really, really disappointing things that I think happens kind of all too often. It's, it's kind of like, oh, sometimes great authors or poets aren't recognized until after they're dead. You know, they, they die in poverty and, and things like that. And I know this is kind of a different application of that complete reverse um well, it's not a complete reverse it, it's either recognition compared to innocence but um innocence in a sense but it's it's just always disappointing that justice wasn't truly served for the people that kind of deserved it so as we know Sirius did not get married he didn't have children and as the portrait of Phineas Nigellus his uh Sirius's deceased great-great-grandfather stated that the direct line of the ancient Black family ended with Sirius's death. Had Regulus lived, he would have been the heir of the Black home. However, he predeceased. He was predeceased by Sirius. So by right, then this heir was either Bellatrix Lestrange, his eldest cousin, but legally invalidated by her murder of Sirius, Andromeda Tonks his second eldest cousin who was disowned, or Draco Malfoy, the next senior male of the Black family, through his mother, Narcissa Malfoy Black. 
However, all their rights were suspended by Sirius's will, which designated Harry Potter as heir to all his worldly possessions. Thus, by the will, Harry in- inherited number 12, Grimmauld Place, Buckbeak, and Creature, and the remaining Black Fortune. So Harry gets more money. Having no great love for number 12, Grimmauld Place, the house that held so many painful memories for Sirius, Harry chose to give it to the Order of the Phoenix for their continued use as headquarters. Creature, forced to serve Harry by Black's will, was sent to work as a Hogwarts house elf in the kitchen in the school kitchens, an imposition which did nothing to improve Creature's hatred of Harry. Buckbeak passed back into Rubius Hagrid's care under the assumed name Witherwings. I uh, so the, the only problem that I have with this is was I thought that I thought that Creature and Harry kind of had this understanding. And then Harry just kind of makes it has this like dick move and sends creature to f- to serve in the uh, Hogwarts kitchens. Like, why couldn't he free him if he had no use for him? Like, that's 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 unfair. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of surprised that he doesn't free him. You know, like basically give him the Dobby treatment. Like, hey, if you want to go be a servant for somebody else, I mean, is there really at the end of the day much that creature can do? Like, all the, the secrets are kind of out, right? They're not worried about. Lestrange is getting a hold of Creature anymore after after the fact. I mean, or maybe there is, so they got to kind of keep him tied up. But it just seems like Harry would have gone through and, yeah, freedom. Freedom! <laughs> it was discovered that Sirius, along with others, had kept had a file kept by the Ministry of Magic while it was under Lord Voldemort's control in 1997. It was actually kept in Dolores Umbridge's office. And the document listed Sirius, Sirius's blood status, the status of his family, and his security status. But because he died in the service of the Order of the Phoenix, his picture had a giant red X crossed over it. Now, Sirius was one of the four shadows that were summoned by the Resurrection Stone to speak to Harry as he went to what he believed his death uh, was his death on May 2nd, 1998. Sirius assured his godson that dying was not painful, that it was faster and easier than falling asleep. He also promised Harry that he and the others would stay with him as he went to confront Lord Voldemort and would stay to the very end. When Harry reached the fire, he allowed the stone to slip from his hand. Thus, his parents, Sirius, and Lupin vanished. Harry later gave his first son, the middle name of Sirius, to honor his godfather's memory. James Sirius's personality was very similar to Black. I think that it was nice that our final time that we see Sirius, he was restored to his healthy kind of pre-Azkaban state, and that his final words in the series gave Harry some comfort in you know, that, that trying time that Harry was facing. I didn't remember what you guys were saying about creatures, so I went and looked it up, and I'm not sure where that information was from, but on Creatures Wiki page, it says that they the last time they saw a creature was when they accidentally led Yaxley back to Grimmauld Place, and then they had to, like, apparate away, so they weren't going to see creature again because it was too dangerous. And it says Creature's whereabouts during the following period is unknown, but it's known that sometime before the Battle of Hogwarts, he somehow came to the Hogwarts kitchens. So this doesn't say anything about Harry sending him to Hogwarts. And then when Voldemort and the Death Eaters attack Hogwarts, Creature leads the house elves in the battle for his his defender, Harry Potter, and the memory of Regulus. Yeah, I remember that part for sure. Mm-hmm. That makes that makes more sense. Like it, that feels better. It is unknown if he continued to work in the Hogwarts kitchens or entered the service of the Potter family, or possibly some consider that Harry may have actually freed Creature at some point after 2017. Creature passed away at age 666. Whoa! Who knew how something Creature was that long? Oh man, that is. Crazy. And there were only like four other house elf heads mounted on the walls at at Riddle House. I mean, if there's only like. It was like the Highlander that could only be one. I mean, the Blacks have been around for ages. <laughs> the ancient house of Black. Yeah, truly. <laughs> if that's a way to measure wizarding time, uh, that's that's not a good. That's not reliable. <laughs> that's not reliable. Reliable. That's wrong. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> well, there's four house so elf heads up here, so that means there's a thousand years worth of history. Well, that does wrap up our serious Black discussion. Our three episode part very lengthy 
Uh, next week, we will get started with Remus Lupin, our final marauder. And the final segment that we have for you today is our questions game, which was a huge hit last episode. It was so funny. I loved it. Um, and I'm sure the other hosts had a uh, fun time as well. Okay, so this question is going to go from me to Gretchen to Luke to Bailey. It's kind of a different flow than what we had last week's episode. And I'm going to kick it off here. Gretchen, have you ever had Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans? Does anyone even like Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans? Do you like beans? What's your favorite flavor of Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans? Did you know that they have a grass flavor? What does grass taste like? I did taste grass once. It was really good. Uh. <laughs> Rave. Ding, ding, ding. We need a sound effect. <laughs> I just, I quit this game. <laughs> they can play drinks and nose sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> I blame it on the loop. So, Gretchen, I can't believe you've never tasted grass. Terrence. What? <laughs> Terrence is out. Wow. <laughs> that sucks. Sorry, you couldn't I, it. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> you feel less bad. Oh, that sucks. I did it. Okay. All right. Head to head. Mono E U. <laughs> yes. Luke. How badly do you want to win this game? When was the last time you won this game? Have I ever won this game? Have I ever won this game? <laughs> what are the odds that I'm going to win? They've got to be better than me because you just won. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Right <laughs> I've already disqualified my friend. It's her before. <laughs> Victor! Victor, all right, Gretchen. Nice job. <laughs> That doesn't seem like it should be such a hard game. Oh, it's it's not until you're actually playing <laughs> and you're on the spot. What can I say next? I think it's about time to get out of here. Thank you so much to all of our patrons who support us. And if you're not a patron, head over to patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio today to get started. Yeah, one thing that I really, really like about the patrons is the vlogs that we're doing. All four of us have done vlogs now, and it's... And just another really cool outlet that we can can share with the patrons that, hey, this is what we're doing sometimes while we're recording. Uh, sometimes this is our really cool, you know, bookshelf collection of uncountable books. Uh, I think it's just been really, really neat to interact in, in those kinds of ways. Yeah, I think my favorite part about Patreon is getting to interact with our listeners through the Slack channel. And it's kind of fun to just always, you know, oh, there's a quick Harry Potter thing that happened throughout my day, and let me go tell our patrons about it, and they can relate to it. Agreed. <laughs> I love it. And as a reminder, you can stay up to date with us over on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And also rate our podcasts wherever you're listening to us, be it iTunes if you listen on the, the uh, podcast app or uh, overcast or anything like that go ahead and just give us a quick star rating you don't have to type out a full review or anything we and we greatly appreciate everybody that's done that so far well thank you so much everybody for tuning in and uh, thank you to our patrons listening to us record this evening who by the way get the full unedited listener experience we really appreciate all of your support i'm Terrence pinkston i'm bailey riddle i'm Luke hogan and i'm gretchen rush that does it for episode 211. We'll be back next week with episode 212. To palindrome. <laughs>